Good afternoon and welcome to today's panel discussion on unlocking the power of finance grade ESG data. I have my esteemed colleagues here from Nordic Trustee, so thank you for coming in today, and also from our partners at Eco Online. So I'm looking forward to a active debate. My name is Jason Gerlis. I'm the regional head of the Americas and head of corporate over here at Aquarium. Today, we're going to cover three different topics. So firstly, data availability. Secondly, transparency and how we can drive better transparency in this field. And then thirdly is the future of ESG data and technology. So hoping that we'll touch on a number of hot topics. Just in terms of brief introductions, so on the panel today, I'm joined by David Pigton. Um, he is the Senior Vice President of ESG and Sustainability over at Eco Online, and his colleague, Helene Melby Borderson. So she's the Head of ESG and Sustainability. Then my colleagues from Nordic Trustee, Kasper Svensson, he is the ESG analyst, so he's been working on their STAM data platform, and Alexander Nervik, who is the Executive Vice President of Digital Products, um, joining us also from Nordic Trustee. So very excited to uh, have all of you on board and uh, looking forward to hearing from you. Just in terms of the businesses, for those of you who have dialed in, so Eco Online are developers of leading software solutions. So they safeguard people and the environment and are strong believers that the right software, the right tools allow organizations to identify, track and eliminate risks in the workplace. So they are making workplaces safer for all of us and we thank them for that. And then our friends at Nordic Trustee. So Nordic Trustee are a subsidiary of Accorian, the global business in the services profession. Nordic Trustee are the leading bond trustee and loan agency provider in Northern Europe. So they have data to a huge amount of financial information. And as we know, investors are more and more interested in ensuring the ESG continuity and fulfillment for their own investments. Um, they've recently developed a platform called Stam Data. So Alexandra is the CEO of Stam Data. Um, and that is the primary source now for Nordic fixed income market info. So they're going to tell us a little bit more about their tool and the sorts of data that they are producing. So again, thank you everybody for, for taking the time out of your busy schedules. So let's dive in. Um, the first topic is going to be on data availability. Um, and David, I'm hoping you're going to be able to kick us off. How do you view the significance of visibility in terms of data in driving effective ESG programs, especially you know, in light of the dramatic rise in those magic three letters over the last couple of years? Yeah, you're right. Thanks, Jason. Yeah, well, absolutely. I mean, I, I think I would start straight away by saying that I think um, data visibility is the lifeblood of uh, proof, evidence and trust of responsible business. I think it's always been the case, but as you say, that has really changed um, over the last few years in particular. And if you look back over the last decade or so, we've seen a 150% rise in the ESG related legislation. There's now something like two and a half thousand in excess uh, pieces of uh, ESG related legislation across the world. So legislation, of course, brings it with it the burden of proof in a sense. And a lot of that growth around data visibility has then driven the need for finance grade data. Now, you know, we're talking about finance grade rather than subjective estimates and assumptions. We're thinking about audits. We're thinking about the focus on legal disclosures. Um, so all of that really brings a certainty or a need for certainty that was perhaps um, uh, not so much there in the past. So there's that, that lifeblood focus on it. And for me, I think the significance of data visibility um, really is summed up in, in five or six key things. I think you need the insight that comes from finance grade data, you know, the insight that comes from focused analysis that enables you to make smart objectives and decisions. Um, you need to focus on materiality. So when we're looking at this data, what matters to the people who matter to your organization, the owners and, and your own people, of course, um, you need to set priorities and make sure you're looking at the right things. Uh, you also need to have accuracy around those priorities. So you need to be clear that the data you're using is visible enough and you've got to the far corners of those organizations and, and the extended parts of the uh, the ecosystem that, that businesses deal with. Um, because, of course, it's changing all the time. So that change is the aspect. This is dynamic. It's always moving. So data, of course, itself is, is a flow of information and you need to respond to that change and stay up to date with it. 
But underpinning all of that, of course, is trust. And that's the essence of it all. So if you look at ins insight, materiality, priorities, accuracy, change and trust, for me, that spells out impact. So it's a little bit of an acronym that I always uh, use that, that helps to focus really on the value of the data, because I think it does three things. The, the data really can be used in, in bids, work winning, all kinds of things that drive the heart of your, your income and your, your top line uh, profitability. You can track progress and make decisions with that accurate data uh, and you can measure, manage uh, and use the outputs for true impact. So overall, I think ESG uh, data and data visibility is the lifeblood of getting this right. Thank you, David, and definitely bonus points for uh, a nice little acronym. <laughs> Thanks. Casper, <laughs> um, may maybe I'll ask you next if you could provide a an investor view. So obviously one of the um, sets of uh, people that will be accessing and using this data are potential investors. Um, what challenges do you think they face in accessing comprehensive information about their portfolios? And you know, it'd be particularly interesting to understand how that works in niche markets such as um, the the bond market that you operate in. Yeah, well, first of all, one of the biggest problems is the lack of ESG data that is available. The international data vendors they have a international focus, leaving out niche markets like the bond markets in the Nordic. And this also creates a, a large data deficit. And this uh, shortfall, this complicates also a full compliance with the SFDR, with the requirements to um, have data on their entire portfolios. And this is where we come into the picture. We're trying to close this gap for our clients by adding data on uh, bond uh, issues. And currently in the market, as we see today, it's often the large resource rich companies Often these are the listed companies that uh, report sustainability information. Uh, consequently, many of the unlisted companies does not provide this information and forcing asset managers to estimate C uh, metrics like CO2 emissions. Uh, for reference, we have uh, created a ESG market report where we found that in 2022, 70% of uh, listed companies on the Oslo Stock Exchange reported CO2 emissions. And compared to, I think it was 33% of the entire market or the entire uh, Norwegian financial market, like capital markets. And however, we hope that in the future, this will be better with the upcoming EU regulation aiming to enhance transparency among smaller companies as well. Interesting. Thank you. So uh, Kind of carrying on that theme then in in regards to to regulation um let's bring alexander into into the debate so um, Thank you. the the disclosure regulation that that casper was was mentioning there and also equally over here in the us the the new sec um enforcement division um you know how how are these developments investing sorry impacting rather investor perceptions and perspectives well, uh, it's uh, it's quite dramatic, I would say. Um, <clears throat> I would see, say in general, SFDR has generally increased investors' focus on sustainability risk on, in companies, uh, and and the new law mandates commercial asset managers to 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 document how they integrate ESG factors and risk into their investment decisions. Additionally, they are required to disclose sustainability profiles on their entire portfolio to clients so it's like complete transparency and that is what drives kind of like this big big demand for esg data on companies and, and investors are pushing the companies to report their sustainability uh, uh data really so i think it's fair to say that sfdr has had a severe impact on investors in general also in the Nordics, spanning from reallocation of portfolios to reclassification of funds in compliance with new greenwashing rules to ESG performance becoming an KPI in the boardrooms of most companies and asset managers. And to just provide you with some context, let me share a few quotes from two of the leading asset managers in the Nordics that we talked to. They said, like, we asked them, uh, how important is ESG to you? in your investment operation and they said like well esg has gone from nice pictures of flowers and oceans to hard regulatory requirements and another one we talked to one uh, very very experienced uh, asset manager so that's been in the game for years and he said 
Now we're seeing the greatest reallocation of capital since the beginning of the industrial revolution. It's profound and persuasive, and it's the biggest change we have seen, at least in our lifetime. So with that, I think we can conclude that SFDR definitely has made its impact on investors. And um, in the perspective of the Nordic bond markets, the niche markets, we have seen a massive growth in green bonds and sustainability-linked bonds over the recent years. And I think that reflects a broader trends amongst investors towards more sustainable investment options, really. So overall, the implementation of SFDR marks a transformative and permanent game changer for investors. And it's designed to facilitate the contribution of private capital towards funding an EU-wide transition to a, to a net zero economy. The flip side of it, though, even though it's a good thing, is that it comes with increased administrative costs for investors and increased data complexity. Indeed. So uh, great opportunities, but great challenges as well. In that context, let me hand the microphone over to Helene. So given the introduction of these directives and the, the additional scrutiny, how do you see the landscape evolving for companies? So how, how, sh how do you think they will be responding to these increased requirements? Oh, it's a great question, Jason. And I think it's in interesting to hear what Casper and what Alexander says here, because it, it, we are on the, like we sit on the other side of the table as we have to report to our owners which is a private equity. And of course they need to report on SFDR and we need to prepare for what you refer to as the corporate sustainable reporting directive. I will go for the short, short version like CSRD <laughs> and it's definitely reshaping the game. It's pushing companies, even those not in direct scope to embrace a more detailed and transparent and accountable approach to sustainability reporting. And as mentioned here, it's the requirement for data is huge and companies directly affected by CSRD, they are facing potentially 82 disclosure requirements with more than 1000 data points. So I think what will surprise most companies is how the new reporting principles and disclosures they, how they actually affect the business strategies. And in some cases, uh, it will even affect your supply chain and your market position. So for those not fully tuned in, I think it will be a steep learning curve indeed. So it's, it's like moving from a compact map to a more detailed one. And uh, I think my best tip is to uh, avoid panicking because I think it's a lot of panic, panicking going on out there. I think it's it's uh, important to prepare immediately, start preparing, and using this year as a practice year, uh, uh, like we do in Eco Online. Um, start like um, you mentioned, David, the importance of it and materiality assessment, and to really do like a data gap analysis. And this exercise will reveal. Definitely that you have a lot of missing data points and you will probably you will have factors that you may not even have previously scrutinized. Like, for example, take climate risk. Um, as soon as you take that into your risk assessment, you will soon discover that, yeah, recycling office waste, that's really no longer good enough, you know, to comply with the common framework. So, but let's not scare everyone off. <laughs> and uh, I think it's important also to look at the great opportunities that comes with this new uh, compliance and um, the new requirements. And I think that the companies really can and should embrace this change and proactively address the data um, and all the transparency and future-proof their ESG strategies. I think it will gain uh, through competitive um, edge in this involving landscape. So proactivity is the difference between this becoming a challenge or an opportunity. So get out, sure. get out ahead of it. 
Um, and I suppose you don't have to reinvent the wheel, right? Because there are firms like Eco Online who have already done some of the uh, the legwork. So um, maybe back to, to Mr. Mr. Picton. So in, in terms of the data challenge and the the company's approach to streamlining their platforms to kind of collect, organize and present that data back to their investors and their clients. Um, how do you see that and, and what advice would you give to to your clients? Yeah, indeed, Jason, to pick up on the points um, the folks made here on the panel, it, it is, um, it's increasingly complex, no doubt about it. Um, I think one of the key challenges is getting hold of the information itself, um, gaps, mistakes, inconsistencies, that, that kind of thing as well. Um, and I think where companies have previously relied on spreadsheets, uh, you know, that, that's going to increasingly become untenable. Uh, and quite apart from the fact that research suggests nine out of 10 spreadsheets across the world have at least one error in it somewhere. So, so errors will obviously start to, to, to compound on errors. Also, Mine are even putting... worse, David. My spreadsheets are even worse than that. <laughs> yeah, I, I, we've all come a long way, haven't we, with spreadsheets? Um, but, but I think um, when you look at this as a whole, um, you know, you've got increasingly remote and hybrid and diverse operations as well. Um, so connecting the, the edge to the enterprise is crucial if you're going to get that true view across the activities. Remote workers, of course, are the way we work now. Um, before you even consider the complexity of supply chains, when you're starting to think about um, things like carbon and scope three carbon as well, and disclosures that happen elsewhere in your value chain. So if you look at that value chain upstream to suppliers, downstream to customers as well, the, the boundaries are being stretched as well. So that's where a lot of that challenge is coming from. So as we would say, I guess we would say it, wouldn't we? But of course, platforms that the, the kind that we provide, you know, software as a service, bringing it all together in one place is really increasingly one of the only ways to collect, organize and validate this information. Given that we're talking about finance grade data upon which capital market decisions are being made, which are being required to be audited and independently verified. So this is serious business as well. This isn't uh, and exactly the points that my colleagues made here. It's not about nice pictures and nice stories. I mean, they're all still behind the activities, but the data at the heart of that is really driving financial decisions. And these, this finance is yours and my pensions as well. You know, these, these, this is real money, uh, real money being invested in real organizations. So I think the, the, what we're doing in terms of the platform that we've developed I mean, I was a former chief sustainability officer, so I used to do this, you know, for, for a job. And, and when we've developed the platform, I've been thinking, you know, what would I want as a chief sustainability officer if I'm going to produce this kind of data? So, so I want it all in one place is the first thing. I'd want unlimited users and data entry from multiple sources. I'd want uh, inputs direct, you know, from manual entries. I'd want feeds to come in from other systems that my organization has got, so electronic data interchange. I'd want to be able to do bulk data uploads. So all of those kind of things are what we're using to make it easy to get data into these platforms. Then we're talking about um, driving the capture down to the point of activity. So you don't have a bottleneck in a small team. You know, you want many users across your organization to access that central hub, update things and keep it on the move all the time. So you need people to be able to access that from wherever they are. Um, we also need to recognize that the data is quite complex. So things like emissions factors for carbon calculations will vary according to different um, territories. And if you've got an organization with multiple territories within its boundaries, offices in different locations, you need to be able to use the right figure. So for example, in our platform, we've got about 133,000 different emissions factors that have been calculated based on specific locations around the world. So you don't have to make estimates or assumptions, you can actually use the right uh, emissions factors for those, those parts of the world. Um, and of course, when you think about audits, you need to be able to have some kind of quality analysis, some kind of quality assurance on those. So you need to be able to see the calculations behind that and to be able to show that for audit purposes as well and, and turn the data over for independent scrutiny, which will be a key part of new legislation like CSRD and the SEC disclosures to prove that someone has looked at your data and shown that it's actually true. And then behind that, of course, you need someone to, to help, someone to hold your hand. So what we've got here at Eco Online is a team of analysts. These are experts who do this every day as their job, and they help customers on that journey, that sustainability journey, if you like, through implementation, development, and then maturing of their data capture so that they're there to, to help them, if you like, understand how to use it best. Okay, thank you. And obviously, you know, greenwashing was mentioned earlier, but the fact mm. is that you need to be comfortable and you need the recipients to trust the data as per the uh, the impact yep. acronym. 
Yeah, very good. Um, before we move on to the next section, maybe um, I'll pose the the same question to you, Casper. So, in terms of your STAM data platform, how, how do you address those same challenges of, of collection, organization, validation of data from disparate sources, manual, automatic feeds, etc.? Yeah, well, uh, first of all, we come in after. Uh, David is finished with the collecting uh, data and creating this for the company. And we also have a team of analysts, but what we are doing is our team are going into annual reports. We're searching online, finding sustainability reports, collecting the data that we need, and we are following the SFDR format. And the problem today is that the companies does not report in the same format. Some reports in uh, megawatt hours, some report in uh, gigawatt hours. So it's not easy to read in everything using a machine. So today we need to do this manually. And to be honest, sometimes it can feel like a manual treasure hunt, going to different uh, companies, searching for scope emissions and all these uh, factors that we are needing to insert into our database. And we are also heavily reliant on companies being upfront and accurate in their reporting, because there's no way that we can uh, verify this other than looking at the data and uh, using data logic and uh, automatization to compare this company against, for instance, uh, an industry average. And then we can try to find out, okay, does this make sense that this company have reported this much emission? Um, unfortunately, we also find some sometimes that companies report wrong in their official annual reports. And this is large companies in Norway or Sweden. Often off, they're often off by a factor of a uh, thousand. And I believe that the most efficient method to find these outliers is to have or to see companies compared to a large database of other companies. Because then you will, uh, will be able to see are the data points this company have provided making any sense? So that's how we work, and uh, yeah, it's a large manual uh, job to collect this data, but it's fun. Tough, and tough work. <laughs> tough work that somebody has to do it. And if you find it yeah. fun, Casper, you're obviously the right man for the job. Yeah, but uh, but but I think I'll let me I'll just jump in on uh, Casper's point there because because it's kind of like. I think Casper uh, the it illustrates uh, a, a very important thing is and it's that ESG data is new to everyone. People find it complex. The regulations and the data what what do they mean? What are are these formats? You know, so when so the world of sustainability merges with financial reporting and the accounting world of IFRS, you have all of these discrepancies leading to yeah some companies reporting data which are off by a thousand that would never happen in a world world of financial reporting but that happens in sustainability we had an example of a swedish company had reported that their scope two emissions was 50 percent of the total scope uh, two emissions in the entire swedish market we're like <laughs> doesn't make sense are you sure yeah yeah so it's kind of like illustrates the kind of like the immature uh, situation when it comes to this type of data and that's why you need to have professional analysts uh, doing some type of quality assurance on the data and provide before it's provided to the investors well, this is the the evolution that regulation brings right yep Fantastic. Well, thank you for your answers. If we uh, move on to the next section, so how can we better drive more transparency? So we've talked about collecting and presenting data back. So how do we ensure transparency to the to the investors and the customers of that data? Um, Helene, maybe I'll start ladies first this time. Um, so from your perspective, what would you say are the key elements of uh, finance grade ESG data? And you know, how can including that into the accounting statements address the interests of CFOs? Well, I think I need to start with your last part of that question, because like one thing I guess for sure will catch the CFOs' attentions 
is that with the new legal requirements and for some countries it's already uh, there, it's a mandatory requirement to incorporate sustainability information into the management uh, report and the fin financial statements. So uh, like, yeah, it goes without saying being in CFO today really needs you to change the gear and uh, maybe learn something more about ESG, <laughs> kind of forced into that. So as Alexandra also mentioned, that this means in short that we will see a new area of um, uh, companies where they have been treating ESG reporting and financial reporting as two separate processes. So as you say, it's, it's all good about having these two processes merged. And um, myself as working in the financial department in uh, EcoOnline, I see there are so many beneficial uh, aspects of integrating finance and the look of finance with ESG. And we have uh, given it so many uh, great opportunities, you know, to save costs and, and, uh, and the environment. So, but when talking about then finance grade ESG data, which is crucial, definitely, and as you say, transparency, it's all about um, finance grade ESG data. But you also have accuracy, consistency, relevance and timeliness. Uh, and I think it's the most important part is, like it's mentioned here, that it's that is precise and it's reliable and um, and it needs to be transparent. So, and there, but I, I also want to highlight another important issue here is that the risk, you know, because with CFO traditionally have been concerned with uh, identifying and mitigating the financial risks and through the um, ESG grade, graded data, um, I think it will become easier to provide insights to the whole package of ESG. So uh, I think it's more easier if I illustrate with this scenario. So imagine this company, um, their business model is dependent on a natural resource, let's say water. And due to climate change, um, they potentially, they are facing challenges, you know, with both availability and the quality of water, and there goes the prices, they will increase. And if if you don't, if you can't like notice these changes, um, they will at the end they will have material influence on the business development, on the financial performance, cash flows, uh, the access to finance, costs, capital. You know, you name it. I think you get to drill here. So, as a CFO, you will be very grateful, you know, to understand and uh, see this kind of get this kind of insights before they uh, happen. And that is, if you have like access to a ESG data management system, that is the reality. You then you can go and see these kind of risks in the, in the long term. Um, so I guess summarizing <laughs> your question there is, is that um, integrating the uh, ESG data into the account statements, it really empowers the CFOs to get valuable insights for informed decision making, risk management, cost efficiency, of course, and uh, not at least the um, enhanced investor relations. Sure. So, so there, there is no difference between the head and the heart, whether or not uh, CFOs care about the environment or social governance responsibilities the fact is it's going to hit them in the back pocket one way or the other exactly um, very good um thank you helene david maybe we'll move back to you so um considering the the emphasis on the balance of the s and g um how do you suggest companies can avoid falling into the tunnel vision of carbon and focusing on the the offset and the their contribution to that aspect are, are there any specific frameworks that you would suggest to ensure a holistic approach to sustainability reporting in, in general 
Yeah, good, another good, good point. Thanks, Jason. I mean, I think this is actually the key point of it all. I mean, there's no doubt at all that, that carbon reporting, greenhouse gas accounting, what have you, has become a bit of a gateway into ESG reporting as a whole. And that might be where a lot of companies start because it is probably the uh, the loudest chick in the nest, if you will, you know, demanding to be fed, you know, and demanding to, uh, you know, actually have its voice heard so it's a good thing you know we are moving towards um, a better understanding i think of climate impacts around the world and the successive cop summits that we've had across the united nations going back to paris that historic agreement in paris in 2015 um, has really raised this to the national level and, and most governments of course despite making their own net zero commitments can only achieve that and get there if the organizations and the businesses within their territories achieve it with them so it, it's all linked in together i think is what we say so carbon reporting has risen right to the top but, but it's not just a checkbox but you just step back and look at that e s and g pillar and i always look at it as as the need to set a challenging balance that changes behaviours for commercial benefit. So when you think of a business, and we're talking here about finance grade and investor markets, the three CBs uh, setting a challenging balance that changes behaviours for commercial benefit is a good way of seeing an ESG program and, and the impact it can have on, on, a, on an organisation. So when I talk about a challenging balance, I mean setting targets that mean something that link you know to that purpose of what that organization is trying to achieve and stretch it you know if it feels a little bit difficult across the three pillars of environment social and governance then you've probably got it about right and it should change behaviors companies should be using this data and these programs to do things in a slightly different way that demonstrate that there's they're more responsible that take them on a more sustainable journey both for the impacts of the communities around them and for their, their own people as well um, and it has to have commercial benefits that there's, there's there's no doubt this wouldn't be financially sustainable if it's done in a vacuum you know it, good esg program done well tracked and measured well can actually generate a profit and a contribution to the bottom line so the sorts of frameworks that i think would help to achieve that balance and show the kind of facts that we should be looking at would include um, things like csrd because it's going to require environment social and governance reporting the frameworks aren't truly locked down and finished yet but companies cannot just see this as a climate agenda it's a holistic agenda of social and governance factors just as much and you're going to be have you have to prove them as well you know it's not just enough to talk about them they're gonna to have to be proven as well going back for what nine years now the un sdgs the sustainable development goals themselves had 17 goals for a better world uh, and they still remain valid on our path and our, our trans transmission i guess towards 2030 only six years away now but we touched on it briefly before helen Ecker, helena reckon echoed it as well that materiality is what really matters so what is important and what matters to one organization and they might be reporting on it maybe completely different in a different sector different organization different area so the most important place to start to achieve that balance is to look at what matters to the people who matter your customers your staff your stakeholders, your investors, your owners, and the communities around your business. If it matters to them, it should matter to you as an organization, and you should be reporting on it. Thank you. So um, a balanced view with lots of data points. Um, Alexander, in terms of the um, unintended consequences of uh, asset managers making estimates on some of those data points, you know, do you have any examples or, or experiences from, from your own past on companies that haven't reported on their data in, in an accurate fashion, um, given what Dave has described as that holistic approach? There's lots of different data points, right? But I'm assuming companies, if they make mistakes, that's where they get accused of, of greenwashing and the like. So any examples that you could give us in terms of where this has gone wrong? Yeah, but I mean, like the one thing is uh, the I incorrect data or data that are off that has been reported by the companies. That is one thing, and and normally, kind of like you have uh, market data providers like ourselves that that makes the company aware of that so they can change it and correct it, right? But the the big problem here is basically that the lack of companies reporting their ESG data. And uh, you kind of have this kind of like uh, uh, situation where uh, you have investors that are demanded in, in intensified to, to have uh, um, ESG data on their entire portfolio. 
But the situation is that they're missing data on probably like 67% of the companies in their portfolio because a lot of them invest in, in the bond markets. They also are a part of the portfolios and, and most companies there are unlisted companies that finance themselves in the bond markets. So basically it means that for asset managers to comply with SFDR, they need to use estimates on these companies. However, doing that comes with a risk of greenwashing accusations if the estimate turns out in a positive way in the perspective of the uh, sustainability performance of the fund. So to avoid that risk, more and more asset managers prefers to use an independent third party to provide these estimates. So it doesn't appear like they have done it themselves, right? Or they haven't. However, in general, using estimates is really not ideal, no matter who does it, because you would like to get the ESG data from the companies based on their sustainability assessment, because it can be very different and you might be very off. So let me give you an example. Most asset managers, they have set carbon reduction targets on their portfolio. Um, and they are required to, let's say they are required to estimate like data on 65% of their portfolio and they have KPIs attached to that performance. So when more and more companies start to report their, uh, for example, emissions data the upcoming year, what do you then do when your estimates turns out to be completely off? It means that you be, need to be either very good at estimating or perhaps creative with your estimates. If you might not reach if you if you're not doing that you might not reach your carbon reduction targets and it will be very interesting to see what asset managers will how they will respond to this challenge going forwards because basically it means that uh, they are, uh, have to stand by their estimates but they can be completely off and uh, the more and more uh, companies starting to reporting emission you have this inflation in the em emissions and in it might cause problems when it comes to reaching your carbon reduction targets. I don't know if that was good explained, but uh, this is us nerding with data and we see this, <laughs> since we're doing this every day, we see the challenges that will pop up a few years ahead. Uh, yeah. and, and using est estimates basically is not ideal is what I'm trying to say. And that's yeah. why you see more and more investors are pushing companies to start reporting on sustainability factors. Yeah, no, it's, it's fascinating stuff, right? Because I think in the industry, greenwashing has a reputation of being an actively nefarious activity. But as easily as you describe, it could be that you did your best. And then as time goes on, you've become wedded to a number that you find it hard to backtrack from. Yeah. So, uh, um, and, the, and the only way to get around this problem is probably to divest, right? Uh, because you need to divest yourself into kind of like reaching your carbon reduction targets. Yeah. Yeah. But then you have to consider the financial impact of that divestment. Uh, so it will be very exciting to to see how how the market responds to this challenge going forward, the upcoming years. Yeah, yeah a seismic change in the uh, the way you finance. <laughs> Thank you. Um, let's move on to the the final question. So the the future of ESG data. So we've we've talked a lot about. The, the regulatory environment and the challenges of providing that holistic and accurate set of reporting. But you know, both of your firms are on the forefront, be at different phases of the process in terms of collating and managing this data. So you know, I'm, I'm interested to see how you see the role of technology evolving in, in the coming years, and I suppose supporting business strategy. So that's, that's the first of two questions. Let me open that mm. one up to the floor. Um, in the first instance, yeah, perhaps I can jump in. Um, I think it's only going one way. I think I think technology is going to be essential to manage and, and support um, ESG reporting. Uh, it's a train that's already left the station. I think that's the important point. And there's there's two groups of organisations that I think are most at risk in that context. There's a group who still see this as optional, and I think they are deluding themselves because it, you know this is no longer optional. That wherever you may sit within the value chain, whether you're a supplier to a big customer or whether you're the big customer itself, you know this is not an option anymore. And there's the others who are relying on manual processes, if you like, and, and spreadsheets and, and, and that kind of thing. There's nothing wrong with spreadsheets per se, but this data, and you look at the title of what we're, we're talking about here, finance-grade ESG data, 
this is stuff that really matters, you know, and this is the stuff upon which decisions will be made. So I think those groups will start to struggle to cope. Um, they will find themselves losing competitive advantage and they could even be potentially in breach of legislation. So I think technology will be at the heart of this and embracing it as early as you possibly can, I think, is the, is the way to start this inevitable journey. Indeed, I mean, investors wouldn't accept their financial data to be done on a spreadsheet. So why would they Absolutely. expect this to be, accept this to be? Um, thank you, David. Um, anyone else want to want to dive in in terms of how they see technology evolving in the coming years? Yeah, I can, I can jump in here. And uh, But first, let me just underline David's point. I mean, like we, we have been talking to like hundreds of companies and investors over the last years and 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 what companies say is you know like they one 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 company had like 35 uh, uh production uh, or fabrics around the world and they did uh, uh 35 360 sustainability assessments using excel spreadsheets sending that up to the head office in norway some poor fellow sitting there consolidating all of this data afraid that uh, in Norway we use uh, a comma as a, a decimal separator, but in IFRS and, and in the rest of the world we use uh, a period, uh, which may might lead to uh, data a thousand times off if you interpret it incorrect. So I mean, like they are like scared when they're doing their job, you know, and now it's going to be audited as well. So I mean, like y you cannot continue on in spreadsheets. You need to have kind of like technology or system backing you up, and this is a permanent change. So uh, I think everyone should have that in in, in their budget. To, to be honest, even though this is not uh, the game that we are in. When it comes to technology in general, I would say like I see that uh, artificial intel intelligence AI is a lot of talk about that now, uh, and I think it, that would enable us to 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 kind of like analyze data fast, uh, create insights, etc. I see that that is a market that is going to explode and we're going to see a lot of value proposition from fintech startups going forwards in that space. Um, I don't see a using AI to use estimates. That is not what investor wants. They are really, really clear on that they want to have data directly from the company, not using like AI generated estimates based on a, a smaller data set. Uh, so I strongly believe AI will will uh, be be very important going forwards, uh, as it will be in for any other business in 2024 and beyond. Thank you, Alexander. That's uh, interesting stuff. Um, before we move on to the the next question, um, anybody else like to chip in? Yeah, I could first say that. I believe with uh, more technology, it's going to be easier to, for me, collect this data. Because as I mentioned earlier, there's not a uh, machine readable language that works today, but uh, there's going to be XBRL formats that companies are going to need to report in. So hopefully in the future, it's going to be easy to do my job today. Good. Well, uh, I, I know that Alexander doesn't intend to replace you with an AI anytime soon, Casper, but <laughs> Let's um, hope not. In, in a lot of industries, it's about making us more effective and efficient, right? Yeah. yeah. But yeah, and we are ourselves, we're using AI to, we're, we're exploring AI as a technology, creating an AI analyst to do the same thing as Casper does, uh, basically. Uh, and we use robotics and various types of uh, stuff to kind of control and uh, ensure high data quality. And of course, that is also something that is going to grow going forward, be important. A brave new world. Yep. A different world. You need, you need to adapt. World. Yeah. 100% in the wind the willow bends and the oak breaks so let's be the willow um in the interest of time maybe i'll move on to on to the final question so um in advocating for increased transparency uh, how do you see esg data contributing to that trust aspect that, that david mentioned earlier that is so important so how can we use esg data to kind of foster better engagement from our from our stakeholders and i suppose enhance overall corporate accountability what role do you see in esg again um, let me let me open up to the floor 
Yeah, I think maybe I have a short answer there for Nordic Christie side. So we are like super convinced that everyone needs to have access to ESG data. It's important for stakeholder engagement. It's important for media requirements, employees, governments, or just all key stakeholders of a company. So um, all of this or this need for data need to have an open platform uh, inspired us to create a site called nordicesg.com, which were a platform we designed to be free and also easy for both ESG learning and also company-specific ESG data. All of this ESG data today is hidden behind paywalls. You need to have uh, other data vendors. You need to have uh, license rights to view this data. But we feel this is open data and should be that as well. And we also believe this in the long term will foster both stakeholder engagement. They will engage with the data, try to correct the companies, and also hold the companies accountable for information that they, that they have actually reported in their official annual reports. Yeah. Thank you, Casper. Uh, and from, our, from a more kind of like a value point of view, I believe kind of like the, with the new CSRD and ESRS, I mean like the, the, the whole purpose is, is to kind of like uh, ensure that companies are completely transparent about their business model, how they're creating value, explain the business model, how do you, how, how do you get cotton for uh, the, like one dollar from uh, Asia? Are those workers, do they have, uh, do they get paid? Do, do they have a uh, good uh, way of work, uh, working days, etc. You know, like you need to be transparent around your whole value chain basically providing that information uh, out to, to, to the to the customers and the consumers and you're kind of like uh, taking social responsibility really and I believe that is a very very good thing uh, and I think uh, that builds trust also you you see in the companies that has been able uh, uh, able to kind of like create success on this like uh, Patagonia uh, the brand clothing brand you know like th th there's multiple stories like this that it's possible to do that you know that you don't need to kind of like you know, yeah. So, so I think the entire thing is all about building trust, really, being transparent, being open, open up, have great values, and provide information to ensure that we we have good business ethics, really, and that's what this is all about. Yeah, Makes I sense. think it's, that is a great summary, Alexandria, and a good point also that it's. At the end, it's all about, you know, being transparent about your being a good business. You're doing good. And and also, as you, as you touch upon, it made me recall this old phrase that no data, no market. And I think it's uh, interesting to see that this phrase is evergreen, as always. And um, But of course, it doesn't really help to have the data as long as it's not accountable or transparent so yeah. that is something to also remember mm. yeah i think uh, absolutely echo that um helena and i think for me uh, if you think about bringing all this together we've covered an awful lot here we've looked at it from the investor perspective and we've looked at it from the you know the actual producer perspective people like helena and myself that are producing this data and um i i think it's important to link the evidence that you you provide so so all of this data underpins evidence proof um you know real facts and figures but i think you need to link it to a framework i always use a framework um, called the five r's so you've, uh, you've had impact so far you've had the three cbs i'm going to round off with the five r's and i think it's important to link this data evidence to five r's um, the first one is revenue so you've got to link it to how this drives your business and how it's driving profitability it's got to have a commercial benefit because that way it becomes baked into the uh, the financial future of the organization um, it has to be linked to risk as well I mean, this is a way to manage risk frameworks of course a way to manage uh, exposure to legislation but all sorts of other operational risks as well Helena was touching on the idea of water scarcity and resource scarcity as well there are so many more risks of course uh, beyond legislation However, there are regulatory frameworks. So the third R is regulation. And this is a good way to link that data to the proof that you're complying with the regulations that bound your business 
um, in, in the right way. And it was, will be different, of course, territory by territory, back to what we said about how much ESG legislation there is out there now. So it's a good way of proving your regulatory compliance. But the last two R's are a little bit softer in a way, and they're, they're arguably more important uh, in a sense of really sustaining the future of your business, because the fourth R is to prove how responsible you are, how you show and demonstrate that and engage your staff who will have to bring this to life, how you engage the people and communities around your business. Quite often you'll be selling to those communities, how you engage the customers that are further beyond that as well to prove to them how you are a responsible brand to invest in and to give uh, money to, if you like, for services or goods. And the final one really is reputation. You know, we live in a, an extremely dynamic and volatile um, world where our reputations are at the click of a social post or a social media feed, uh, are vulnerable, extremely uh, fragile, uh, and sometimes rightly so, but sometimes it's important to pay it forward. So either way, the ESG data, transparency, trust, engagement, and the overall accountability for me gives a framework for transparency to ESG data that takes it way beyond a checkbox, way beyond a spreadsheet, way beyond a technology platform, way beyond an yeah. investor's report and into genuine good um, for, for the future of us all. And on that note, uh, my final word is that or note is that uh, you need also to benchmark yourself against others. How are we performing? And because you have yeah. the, the, the three KPIs in the boardroom these days is people, profits, and planets. And then you need ESG data on other companies to evaluate your performance or against the industry benchmark or average to assess yep. yourself. How are we improving compared to the to our peers? Yeah, like your example earlier, if your target is to only be producing 50% of the carbon emissions in the entire Norwegian market, then maybe you could give yourself a bit of a stricter, yeah. a stricter goal. <laughs> Very good. Um, I'm conscious of time, so we're going to be wrapping up shortly. Before I do, just to make sure I don't cut anybody off, has anybody got anything they would like to add? For me, that, that was extremely helpful. I mean, I consider myself an ESG layman um, in the corporate side of the business. Obviously, I have an ESG agenda within my business unit, and a lot of my clients um, are as you know well, focusing more and more on this. But you know, that that was an excellent summary from all of you. So I appreciate your time and to share of your expertise. Um Hopefully Jason, the audience, Jason, I just oh, add, sorry, add, David, after you, sure. Yeah, no, sorry, sorry to cut through. I just want to your point as well. I think there may be people listening that think, you know, they've missed the boat here. They're, they're, you know, they're behind the curve as well. And I'm always reminded of an ancient Chinese proverb, which says that the best time to, to plant a tree is 20 years ago. Um, if, if that's true, then the second best time is now. So if you are listening to this today, you know, the, the, whilst 20 years ago might have been great, today is just as good. So as long as you don't leave it beyond today, uh, act now, I think would be all of our panel's plea uh, wherever we come from. Thank you, David. And, you know, we will be sharing as part of the distribution of this webinar, all of your details. So the respective web pages for um, Stam data within Nordic Trustee and Eco Online, plus each of your LinkedIn profiles. So I do hope that those of you who are dialing in to listen to this reach out if you have any questions. And indeed, we can always bring the panelists back together. So if there is a variation of theme or specific topics you'd like us to cover next time, please let us know. So. Thank you, everybody. Wishing you the uh, the best of luck, health, and happiness for the rest of 2024. Mm. Thanks, Jason. Thank you, Jason. Excellent. Likewise. Thanks all. Thank Bye. you, Jason. Goodbye. Bye.